What if you could see an idea? What if you could hold an idea in your hand and shape it, molding it and carving it and adding to it until it became solid, firm, and defined? In fact, it becomes so clear that other people could understand every facet of it just by seeing it, regardless of how complex it was. If you've ever had the feeling that you knew something or believed something, but just couldn't find the words to explain it so that other people could understand it the way you did, you know how powerful seeing an idea would be. And what if those other people who you showed this idea to could hold it in their hands and continue to shape it so that they could add the richness of their experience, knowledge, and wisdom? Now, what if I told you that nearly everyone is born with this innate ability, that you have it, and yet for some reason, you are told by your teachers, bosses, and maybe even your parents to knock it off. Up to now, you've seen me taking visual notes in support of the amazing talks we've heard today. You've probably had a few reactions. What the heck is that guy doing? And then, oh, I get it, that's pretty cool. And maybe, hey, I think I could do that. If you're one of those folks, good news. I'd like to invite you to engage with the rest of this talk in a way that might be new for you. Please take out the notebooks and pens that were at each of your seats and draw what you hear. Take visual notes. You also have a cheat sheet from my colleague, Mike Rohde, on some techniques for this. You'll get it as soon as you see it. And if you don't want to take visual notes, please just doodle. It's okay. I won't take it personally if you're not staring at me, as long as I have your permission to draw too. As you get started, I'd like to ask a question. What's wrong with this picture? Why don't we let kids doodle? All children doodle. It comes naturally. It requires no instructions. And yet we tell them not to do it. Why? I was a kid who always had two pieces of paper on my desk. One for my notes and one for doodles. I got in trouble a lot. Especially in algebra. And I heard all the objections. You're not paying attention. That's useless. And this isn't art class. Today, I doodle professionally. And more than that, I give people tools to help them see ideas. Visual tools to help solve really hard problems. Problems that would be impossible to solve any other way. So why do we teach kids that doodling is wrong? I believe doodling is today what left-handedness used to be. My grandfather was left-handed. His teachers would beat his knuckles with rulers if he didn't write with his right hand. He got by at writing with his right hand, but as a result, he developed a stutter. He got out of school, started writing with his left hand, and immediately lost his stutter. I can't help but wonder what school would have been like for him if he'd been allowed to write with his left hand to do what came naturally. As a father of four young children who are just beginning their education, my biggest fear is that their schools will continue to ignore the fact that different children learn in different ways. My colleagues Sonny Brown and Rachel Smith have spoken at TED conferences before about the power of drawing ideas. I'd like to build on their thoughts, along with those of other visual practitioners like Diane Bleck and Dean Myers, who continue to evolve the conversation around visual note-taking in education and business. I'd like to talk about why I believe doodling can help engage students in learning, ready them for a complex world, and make school fun. And I'd like to do so by turning the three biggest misconceptions about doodling on their heads, that it's distracting, that it's useless in the real world, and that its only place is an art class. First misconception, it's distracting. Doodles are black and white proof of a wandering mind. They are inescapable evidence of inattention and carelessness. They are irrefutable signs that you weren't listening. And if you weren't listening, how could you have been learning? So here's what we know. We learn by seeing, hearing, and doing. You've heard of the visual learner, the auditory learner, and maybe you've heard of the kinesthetic or motion active learner. No one is purely one kind of learner. It turns out that everyone has some aspect of each of these learning styles, and the more that you engage all of the learning styles, the greater the understanding and retention. Traditional chalk and talk teaching only engages a fraction of the brain's power to conceptualize information. Doodling, on the other hand, engages all three styles. A doodle doesn't even have to be related to the subject matter to engage the kinesthetic learner. I love this quote by Sonny Brown, there is no such thing as a mindless doodle. A study of people listening to complicated phone messages found that doodlers retain 29% more content over non-doodlers. 
Did you get that? Doodling keeps you from losing focus on a boring topic, which is why I asked you to draw while I was talking. But when doodles are relevant to the subject, you make a personal connection with what you are hearing. You think, what does this concept remind me of? What does it look like? What can I draw that represents it? What metaphor could I use to describe it? This active mental process cements comprehension. It creates object permanence around the idea. It establishes an experiential memory that allows the learner to make connections and see patterns that would have been invisible to the passive learner. Doodling enhances learning in every way, giving shape and form to the abstract. We learn by doing, and we learn by doodling. Second misconception, it's useless in the real world. It's not professional. You don't need it to do your job. Your boss isn't paying you to doodle. Okay, for right now, we're going to ignore the following professions. Visual practitioners like me, artists, illustrators, architects, engineers, creatives, designers of all kinds, and anyone else who has to draw as a part of their job. And instead, we'll focus on what my algebra teacher called real jobs. Have you ever seen this before? It's been called Texas's most famous napkin. It's Herb Kelleher's concept for the original business model for Southwest Airlines, and it was literally drawn on the back of a napkin. San Antonio, Dallas, Houston. There's a book about that story if you're interested. It's called Back of the Napkin. Regardless of what your job is, chances are you have to solve hard problems or communicate complex ideas. Doodles are the pure language of ideas. There's a saying, you don't build a house from a set of instructions, you use a blueprint. When an idea is well-defined and simple, words are better at conveying meaning. For example, if someone said, make me a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, I wouldn't need a picture to understand the message of what they were trying to get across. But when the idea is more complex or ambiguous, drawings become more effective and words lose their effectiveness. Think about the last time that you sat through an 80-slide PowerPoint deck or read a 100-page strategic plan. The University of Stanford studied the use of collaborative participatory group visuals in meetings and found that they increase retention by 17%, improve consensus by 19%, and actually shorten the time it takes to solve problems by 24%. Unfortunately, just putting clip art in PowerPoint doesn't cut it. This is about using visuals as a medium to gather ideas, solve problems, and plan the way ahead. The fact of the matter is, the professional world is changing. Jobs are becoming less and less defined. Recent studies have shown that creative thinking and the ability to deal with ambiguity is more critical to success than depth and expertise. The workplace is becoming less about transactions and more about design. And designing anything, whether it's a process, a product, a service, or a solution, without visuals is sort of like music without notes. Just a lot of people talking. I want to take a minute and share some of those visual tools that can cut through ambiguity and design solutions. You have your brainstorming tools like mind maps, word clouds, and concept maps. You have decision making tools like force field diagrams, decision trees, affinity diagrams, fish bones, and quad charts. And if you really want to geek out, you can call these Ishikawa diagrams and these Johari windows. You have your planning tools like Gantt charts, swim lanes, and process maps. You have your whole systems tools like learning maps, vision maps, knowledge maps, and context maps. Plus, there's all the cool stuff that you get to use. Whiteboards, groupware, templates like the business model canvas or the graphic game plan, and my own personal favorite, paper and markers. What I just demonstrated is something called a mind map. In my opinion, a mind map is the single greatest tool for brainstorming new ideas, period. This is how we should be teaching our kids to take notes or to prepare to write reports or essays. It's a simple network diagram used to capture ideas in a structured way, which is helpful because when you brainstorm, it's anything but structured. You start with a central image or idea. From there, you branch outward, following key ideas as they occur. You move up and down in levels of detail, adding new branches to the trunks, following wherever your mind goes. You draw cross connections as ideas interrelate. One idea will suggest another, and used in a group setting, a mind map grows like wildfire. One last thought about using visuals in the workplace. I love it when a client grabs my markers out of my hand, sketches a few simple shapes, and proceeds to say, it's like this, and uses the sketch to describe a strategy or action plan that usually has little trouble achieving buy-in. The biggest breakthroughs always come when someone picks up the marker. Third misconception, this is an art class. 
This isn't the time or place. It's not normal note-taking. We're not teaching art here. Let me ask a question. At the end of the day, what's the point? What's the point of forbidding kids from doodling in their notes? It's their notes. Let them take notes in a way that they'll remember. And yes, kids do get in trouble over this today. So do grown-ups, for that matter. So what's the point? Do you want kids to have nice, neat, clean, sterile notes that copy verbatim what the teacher writes on the blackboard, or whiteboard, or PowerPoint, or whatever it is? Or do you want kids to learn and retain what you're teaching? I'm not suggesting kids draw all over their homework or test or anything that they have to turn in. On the other hand, how cool would it be if students turned in a mind map along with the final essay that was the end result so teachers could actually see the thought process that went into the final product? Isn't teaching kids how to think the point of school in the first place? There's two studies I want to share with you relevant to note-taking. Tony Buzan, one of the world's leading authorities on the brain and learning techniques, asked students to tell him the words they most often used with note-taking. The top seven were boring, punishment, depression, fear, wasted time, rigidity, and failure. Buzan went on to create a new style of note-taking that he called mind mapping. The other study I want to share is a bit more recent. Dr. F. Robert Sable of Purdue University looked at some of the effects of No Child Left Behind. You can probably guess some of the findings, that the emphasis is on finding the simplest answers, that there are higher incidents of discipline and behavioral problems, that there is favoritism towards tested subjects, that there is growing apathy and resentment and decreased work ethic, and that there is low morale and low idealism of teachers. But here's what was really surprising. When it came to drawing or other visualization, students reported that it was fun. How about that? Students drew because they enjoyed it. It relaxed them. They felt like they could express themselves. It helped them deal with uncertainty and ambiguity, and that it helped them learn new things and solve problems. No kidding. So here comes my favorite question of all time. What if? What if students were allowed to take visual notes in all their classes? Why restrict drawing to art class? Which, by the way, is becoming less and less an option. Over 13 million students in the U.S. have either lost all access or never had any access to any visual arts program of any kind. That's one in five students. And if they haven't lost access altogether, it's very likely that it's been reduced and will continue to be reduced. And the real loss here is that doodling is something we were all born with. Find me a child who doesn't doodle. It's natural to all of them, and yet we train it out of them. Because it's distracting, it's useless, it's not the time or place. And kids grow up to be adults who say things like, I'm not a visual person, or I can't draw. To that last point, I can't draw, I want to do an experiment. We're going to do a bit of guided imagery. This is a quick exercise I learned from my friends at Communication Slotson, a German visualization firm. Please find a blank page in your notebook. Now, take a deep breath, release. In your mind, I'd like you to all go back to when you were a child. There was always a doodle, one doodle, one drawing, one picture you drew. You drew it over and over and over again. It's so ingrained in your memory, you shouldn't have to think hard to remember it. Draw that doodle. Here's what most people draw. A picture, a person or a face, a word, something abstract, or something from nature. What do all these have in common? It's not what you would call fine art, but it's not supposed to be. It's quick. It uses simple shapes. It's iconic. It's a symbol for an idea. It's not what a house actually looks like, and yet people know it's a house. It's the idea that matters most. When you use simple shapes and simple icons, you have everything you need to take visual notes. Let's do another what if. What if you're a teacher and you catch a student doodling in class, or you're a boss, and you catch an employee doodling in a meeting. Your first thought will be that they're distracted and not paying attention. It's okay, you've been told your whole life that that's what was going on. Here's a simple test you can use to find out for sure. Ask them a question. What do they think about what you just said? What do they understand about it? What did they hear? 
It's not to play gotcha. It's to find out if they learn by doodling. And then ask yourself, what's the point? What's important to you? Do you want them to sit as still as statues, eyes wide and locked on you? Or do you want them to maybe learn something? 51% of us are introverts. 29% of us are predominantly visual learners. 37% of us are predominantly kinesthetic learners. With those numbers, chances are more than a few of your listeners would hear what you have to say best if they were doodling. Here's the message I want to leave with you. Doodles help you learn better. Doodles have real-world application. And doodles can make learning fun. Anyone can doodle because at its core, it's not about artistic skill. As you probably noticed as you were taking visual notes, the real skill is listening and making a personal connection to the content. And here's what I would ask of you. Please draw. Think with ink. Think what's right with this picture. If you have a pen in your hand, draw. If you're a teacher, a parent, a caregiver, a manager, or a leader, create a space where doodling is okay. I honestly believe that I have the best job in the world. I help people see ideas. When you create a space where doodling is okay, you allow others to see ideas too. Thank you.